Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Chris Goff, and I was asked to talk a little bit about some of our experiments at the University of Michigan Biological Station that are geared toward understanding how the forest carbon cycle is responding to biotic disturbances. Um, I want to acknowledge co-PIs and, and PIs, Ben Bon Lamberty and Peter Curtis, very much part of this work. And, um, and also our funders, the National Science Foundation and the DOE. And I just wanted to give you a full disclosure here that I'm, I'm an experimentalist who partners with modelers. So that might help you understand my interpretation or my perspective today a little bit more. Um, today's talk will cover uh, context. We'll think about how disturbance is changing in the upper Midwest and how that might be affecting the carbon cycle talk about two experiments that we've implemented at the University of Michigan Biological Station. Then I'll end with a few thoughts on challenges and opportunities as I see it. Uh, so our, our fundamental question is how will changing disturbance regimes affect the carbon cycle in the region? UMBS is nested within the Upper Great Lakes Basin, um, right in the middle there. And this is a temperate forest landscape that suffered quite a bit of, of disturbance, but those disturbances are changing. So if we rewind the clock about a hundred years ago, clear cut disturbances, deforestation that resulted in essentially hundred percent tree mortality were very common. These are wise, widespread in the region, but most of these forests have now regrown and recovered and they're a century, a century or, or more uh, or older. And um, what we're seeing instead is a transition to more moderate severity disturbances, like those from wind throw or other extreme events, emerald ash borer, uh, spongy moth. And that's just to name a few of, again, these partial disturbances that don't cause the complete severe stand replacing mortality that clear cuts did, but which do modify the structure uh, and the species composition of a forest pretty substantially but not again at, a, at the level of 100% mortality typically. And so we're interested in how those disturbances are shaping and reshaping the carbon cycle in the region. Um, I should mention the, these kinds of gradients of disturbance severity exist elsewhere. So if we look at Hurricane Katrina, post Hurricane Katrina radiating from the eye of the storm, we see a gradient uh, of high to relatively low tree mortality, the red to the greens, um, as we radiate away from the eye of the storm. So these patterns of disturbance severity across landscapes exist in a number of contexts, and we would expect that there should be differences in carbon cycling responses across this continuum of disturbance severity. So at UMBS, we've used a number of large scale experiments to model and study um, on the ground empirically the effects of disturbance on ecosystem scale processes. I'm not going to talk about our experimental clear cut work uh, today, but that's something we've done. I'm going to talk more about experimental partial defoliation and how that's informed our understanding of carbon cycling in the in the area in the regions for us. So the first experiment was the the forest accelerated succession experiment. This was initiated in May of 2008, and this involved stem girdling 7,000 aspen and birch, those are early successional species, at a landscape scale of 39 hectares, most of which was contiguous. So a large landscape scale manipulation. And again, emphasizing here that this is an early successional uh, targeted experiment. We were targeting those aspen and birch that were maturing, reaching sort of the end of their lives and accelerating advancing succession um, through stem girdling. And if we look at that landscape a few years after stem girdling, we see that there's quite a bit of mortality, about 40% tree mortality at the landscape scale, but that it's heterogeneous, heterogeneous with respect to its distribution on that landscape. So we had pockets of high disturbance severity, high mortality, and pockets of low tree mortality. When we look at the results from this experiment, what, what surprised us and really opened up a, a, a new area of research for us was that 
we observed, this wasn't surprising, a, a decline in leaf area in the moderately disturbed facet forest relative to the control. So about a 40% decline in leaf area index. But what was surprising is that 40% reduction in leaf area did not correspond with a commensurate decline in net ecosystem production. So in other words, the ecosystem lost or the landscape really lost 40% of its leaves and it was still able to sustain uh, a comparable level of carbon sequestration relative to the control, right? So that's, that was surprising to us. Um, looking within that landscape, recall that there's quite a bit of variability in tree mortality within the landscape itself. We showed that we had to push the ecosystem to about 60% or really beyond 60% uh, tree mortality by basal area before we saw net primary production decline. So 60% of the trees had to be killed before at least biomass accumulation, carbon sequestered in biomass, NPP, declined. Again, surprising to us that this ecosystem could tolerate such high levels of disturbance without a decline in carbon cycling function, at least net ecosystem production and net primary production. And, and maybe not, again, not so surprising is that models failed to capture this observed resistance to disturbance. So when we looked at model behavior and different kinds of models, so BiomBGC, Ed, Zelig, all different categories of models, none of those models were able to simulate the observed high resistance that we saw in the field experiment. So sort of interesting, and surprising, um, though not intuitive, of course, that that um, a loss in leaf area of that magnitude would would allow still for stabilization of of high levels of of NEP. So this experiment showed us that forests can sustain high levels of, of carbon uptake following moderate severity disturbance, and and again that sort of established that models have a difficult time simulating this high resistance to disturbance. So our second experiment, the forest resilience threshold experiment, which was initiated with collaborator and, and PI Ben Bon Lamberty of PNNL more recently, coupled the modeling and the field component on the front end. So we didn't do that so much in the first facet experiment. Um, so in this case and in this context, we thought both about the model limitations, which we had learned in part from the FACET experiment, and also what we know and understand about the site and perhaps the mechanisms controlling resistance. And we brought that to our second experiment when formulating the experiment, particularly as we were thinking about this, the site knowledge. We had quite a bit of data um, both to parameterize and inform the models and to inform our, our priorities in the field. And the idea then was that the models would, would as well sort of feed back and tell us what data we should collect um, and, and maybe then revise our efforts in the field in future years to collect data that would be required to enhance the modeling component of the study. There was a a uh, slightly smaller scale, 3,600 trees girdled, and this included all species as potential targets of girdling. This was spread out over 16 acres and replicated, importantly, in four different ecosystem types, so four different forests, and across a, a gradient of disturbance severities as gross defoliation levels from 0, 45, 65 to 85%. So pretty broad range of disturbance severities for different ecosystems. And I'm just gonna to touch on what we've observed so far. So in 2021, last field season, a couple of years after the, the initiation of the experiment, what we see is a, a reduction in VAI across the disturbance severity gradient. Again, not, that's not surprising, but what's been interesting is we see a sustained reduction in soil respiration and yet, remarkably stable primary production across this gradient of disturbance severity, suggesting that net carbon balance may be sustained 
again, very counterintuitively, even though we implemented this treatment, which will eventually result in 85% tree mortality. What supporting that resistance and eventual resilience is something we're thinking a lot about, um, perhaps structure. So we've observed, and I'll show you in a moment, that more complex structures may be more productive and perhaps more resistant. Why might that be? Well, as Fisher and all showed very nicely in the paper, um, their paper that different radiative transfer schemes perhaps could affect, do affect, we know at least in observational studies, how much carbon is sequestered by an ecosystem. And so we might hypothesize then that changes in structure associated with disturbance would have an effect on processes that regulate carbon uptake. And also that that might be important in modeling and simulating um, the resistance to disturbance. So this just in, give you some, a preview of what we found so far, not yet quite published, but showing us that at least observationally in the field, we do see a strong relationship between uh, rugosity, which is a measure of complexity of the canopy, canopy complexity, uh, in relation to net primary production resistance. So where we see an accumulation of complexity on the right side of this figure, there, there's higher net primary production and less likelihood that the, the stand at the stand scale will see a decline in production in response to disturbance. So that complexity is conferring some benefit with respect to resistance. We don't exactly know why, again, and what's sort of interesting and surprising is that um, our modeling results don't necessarily um, mirror that. I'll show you that in a moment. So experiment two, the mechanisms that sort of underpin, we think, high production following disturbance, more complex canopies, more biodiverse forests appear to be more productive. Disturbed forests may do more with fewer leaves. So they're, they're, they appear to be more resource use efficient, fewer leaves photosynthesizing at a higher rate. Um, forests with an intact subcanopy compensate for tree mortality more rapidly. This makes sense. This relates to legacies within the ecosystem. Having a seed bank, having a sub canopy intact appears to be important in supporting that resistance. Changes in our carbon uptake and loss and maybe offsetting changes following disturbance um, may, if they cancel out one another, again, allow for sustained high rates of, of net carbon balance or net carbon uptake. We go to the model modeling exercise, a couple of modeling exercises here. One led by Alexei Shaklamanov and presented in Global Change Biology found that parameter uncertainty and not the radiative transfer scheme was more important in ED2 to simulating the observed effects of Forte. So that was sort of interesting to us. And again, counter to what we're observing in the field, why we don't exactly know just yet. Um, also of interest is that there was a strong interaction between the disturbance treatment or treatments and climate. So the initial response or the resistance of carbon cycling processes to disturbance and the rate of recovery was largely impacted by the climate during the period of resistance and uh, initial resistance and recovery. So that climate disturbance interaction appears to have a really important effect on how ecosystems recover. So I'm going to throw out just three quick challenges and opportunities that we might want to talk about later. One is thinking about modeling different sources uh, of disturbance and compounding disturbances and across scales. So as we, we just have shown, the the scale can matter, right? There's heterogeneity within the landscape. Uh, and at the stand level, the processes that are playing out uh, can be different, sometimes scale, but not necessarily directly because of the heterogeneity associated with what we see across landscapes. Um, so, so we have a spatial uh, challenge, I think, associated with scaling, as well as understanding whether different disturbances, which prompt different physiological and structural effects would result in similar outcomes as to what we observed 
in our field experiment? My hunch is, my guess is they wouldn't, that different experiment sources, even at the same levels of disturbance severity, would result in, in different outcomes, different um, carbon cycling consequences. And we know that because we know, or we think that because physiological processes respond differently to different disturbances. And the structure of a forest, the restructuring of a forest, it is different depending on the disturbance source. So fire, ice, and defoliation, for example, will affect different parts of the canopy. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that there have been a number of large scale manipulations focused on disturbance. I think the challenge or a challenge is, is unifying some of these disturbance studies moving forward. Often they're conducted in sort of modular fashion and not always at the beginning with a, a coupled model field experiment um, interaction and feedback in mind. A second challenge is modeling and, and measuring biotic disturbance climate interactions. Our, our Western colleagues, Western US colleagues have done this quite well when they think about bark beetle and climate interactions. But there are a number of contexts where these climate disturbance interactions may be relevant and important and um, Certainly, that could it appears to extend to our system, at least the models would suggest that, uh, and yet we don't have experiments in our region to test those models. Uh, a third opportunity and challenge is understanding forecasting in the long term, and we can talk a lot about this. Um, ecologists talk about this quite a bit, so to models, we need long-term data sets, but we also need long-term manipulations. We're accumulating long-term observational data sets. I would suggest that we we also need more long-term uh, observations from experimental sites, sites where we have conduct coordinated experiments of disturbance, maybe disturbance climate interactions um, that will allow us to reduce that uncertainty associated with longer term forecasts. And so with that, I will uh, stop and thank you for listening and I look forward to more discussion today.